So in my last session here, um, I was told that uh, that once the temperatures go above 100 degrees, you're not obligated to wear a tie in Vegas. So apologize if, uh, if, if I'm offending anyone. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction and for letting me speak here. I'm, uh, <coughs> I guess, a sort of a weird hybrid, as uh, my good friend Glenn Hammer knows pretty well. Uh, we started working together at the Solar Energy Industry Association um, almost 10 years ago, I would say, and, uh, and never looked back. I think. You know, there's this weird, you know, love-hate relationship that we all have with government, where there's a group, there's a group of people who think, you know, the private sector is what results in growth, and there's a group of people who believe that the government dictates growth. And and what you find, and there's been a whole bunch of um, articles written about this in the last week for some reason, is that the tech, the tech sectors, and the tech, the sectors we really look at, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the iPad, the iPhone, actually results in very, very few jobs, right? So, like, you know, the the hardcore tech sector, from Intel to others, have a lot of great jobs, but the soft uh, part of that of that piece creates very few jobs. And so now we're asked, we're asking ourselves, in the face of the great stagnation, which is what Tyler Cohen. Um, titled his book that came out a few months ago. Um, what do we do, right? We want to achieve 4% growth in this country. We want to like achieve that kind of level of growth in many of the Western countries to keep up with the Asian tigers and some of the other folks that, that everyone's following. And the answer is, is you actually have to build stuff, right? That you actually have to get down to where people are actually doing something. They're drilling for natural gas, they're improving the water system, they're putting in energy efficiency technology, they're building renewable energy, but they're doing something, right? That, that the challenge is, is that having four folks who create a fantastic game called Angry Birds and then finding, you know, 500,000 people to download it makes them extraordinarily wealthy but doesn't actually create a whole bunch of jobs in our country, right? So, so the challenge is, is that we all, I think get this at a very fundamental level. We, we get the fact that we actually have to start building stuff again. Um, and, and we have this, this love-hate relationship with government that's holding us back. And then we talk about green jobs and, you know, I think a lot of folks, including myself, are offended by the term green jobs because I just feel like the hundreds of jobs that I created at Sun Edison weren't green jobs, they were real jobs. I feel offended that when people call me a social entrepreneur as opposed to a real entrepreneur, um, it, it seems like you know there's a double standard for those of us who have succeeded in in uh, in fields that happen to do well by doing good, um, and so. So there was a discussion in the last uh, panel uh, around this green jobs piece, and I think the conclusion of, of, of the discussion was that actually there's an intermediate layer that actually makes a difference, right? That it's green entrepreneurs, it's people who are actually um, in the tens of thousands that are across the country who have decided that they're going to... Um, you know, take all their life savings and actually put it to work to try to create their own company um, that are actually the ones who are responsible for creating the employment um, that we so desperately want. Um, so now you get back and you ask yourself again, well, what's government's role in this? And for those of you who don't believe in government subsidies, let's put those to the side. The Carbon War Room works only on technologies that don't need any incremental legislative or policy mechanisms from a money point of view that are already cost effective, invented in the 70s and 80s and 90s, that are already mature, that people already sort of say, yeah, those things work. And we figure out why they don't scale, why they still don't scale. Um, I'll give you an example. In the shipping industry, there's over 45 technologies from low friction paint that Asker Nobel and Dow and lots of other folks have invented to propeller design to Russian torpedo designs where um, they blow air along the hull of the ship um, to reduce friction, all of which have a two-year payback. The low friction paint is a 10-month payback in terms of fuel savings. But because the ship owners don't pay for the fuel, it's the customers that pay for the fuel. Um, they had no incentive to spend a single dollar on their ships to upgrade them. So what we realized was that in fact the customers of shipping services were wasting 70 billion dollars, with a B, uh, of fuel per year because they weren't demanding more efficient ships. So what we did was we figured out a way to actually publish the fuel economy ratings on every single ship in the world and so that's now there on shippingefficiency.org and cap 
Gemini and Accenture and others are redoing the logistics plans for all these major companies and saving them hundreds of millions of dollars a year in fuel. And you can imagine when a Walmart or a Rio Tinto or a Cargill or somebody else decides to shift their shipping uh, buy from G grade ships to A grade ships, uh, Maersk and a lot of other ship owners start to realize, wow, you know, we actually need to upgrade our G-grade ships. Otherwise, we're going to lose these customers because we only have so many A-grade ships. Um, so this is what we do as the war room. We try to figure out where the systemic market barriers are that are in the way. And what I would posit to you is that, in fact, government plays a key role in that. That for someone like Sun Edison, where we figured out how to actually make solar um, accessible to CFOs who had no intention of spending any money on solar, um, we still had to get permits. Right? We still had to figure out how to work with the electric utility industry for integration into the, into the grid, which means that if the utility didn't want to help us with that, we had to work with the Public Utilities Commission to do that work. Uh, we still have to work with all sorts of people in the government, even if we're not getting money. And so what I would submit to you is that the vast majority of entrepreneurs, and in fact the vast majority of employees within the Fortune 500, have long lost the ability to actually have that productive interaction. That in fact, you know, since the 1980s, we as a society haven't actually spent a lot of time dealing with infrastructure. And it hasn't been our main modus operandi. And so now we're sitting there with government officials who haven't you know, been around um, to do these kind of things. The heyday of project finance was back in the late 70s and 80s before the passive active loss rules for the tax infrastructure came into place. And so the vast majority of people that we worked with at Sun Edison to do investing were over 60 years old, not because, you know, those are bad things, but but people ask me all the time, well, gosh, if you're so damn cost effective and these things are happening, why can't you get more capital? And my response is because I'm working with the B team. I mean, the bottom line is when you go to Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or somebody else, not a single person making over a million dollars a year is working with me. Right? It's the guy that's making $250,000 a year and his bonus is $25,000 that's working with me. And his or her perspective is, Jigger, why are you making me think? Because no matter how much I think, I'm not going to get a bigger bonus. I'm not going to make more money. I might as well do the stuff that I did last year, again. You know, I don't want to spend another 60 days trying to figure out this new financial transaction that, which is not so new, but you know, it's maybe IBM is behind it because they're trying to get big cities to go green and they've already, you know, for 20 years figured out how to do energy audits across all their buildings. They've figured out there are all these savings available and all these things. But, you know, there's, they don't want it, again, just like Sun Edison faced, their CFOs are saying, look, I've got $4 billion worth of capital requests, $2 billion of which I can actually fund. And the last thing I'm going to do is to don deny another $100 million worth of capital requests because of your energy efficiency stuff. I don't think that's core to my business. Right? What's core to my business is doing automation upgrades. What's core to my business is figuring out how to actually, you know, reduce the amount of energy that my chips use. Whatever it is that they think is core to their business, it's not energy efficiency. Um, there was a guy from the National um, Economic Council in the current administration who called me and said, Jigger, I've heard that you're the guy to talk to to talk about for-profit ideas. And I, I graduated from the University of Chicago, and these DOE people keep pushing me on energy efficiency. And I just don't understand it. It pays for itself. Why isn't anyone doing it? And I asked him, I said, you know, where do you live? And he said, oh, this great old house we picked up. It's 60 years old. And I said, you know, do you know that the president passed some bill that gives you a 30% tax credit, it's a 25% rate of return to upgrade your windows to energy efficient windows. And he said, yeah, I know that, but I've got a kid in private school and my car is old and I need a new car. And I said, well, Walmart has a kid in private school and has, you know, has a company they want to buy in Brazil. Right? So instead of actually upgrading all their stores in the U.S. in energy efficiency, they actually want to conquer the world. It is what it is, right? And so you've got you've to figure out what the systemic problems are to climate change or, if you don't believe in climate change, resource constraints. Or if you don't believe in resource constraints, economic growth for the country. Either way, they're all the same solution sets, right? And so the question then becomes, what are these systemic changes and what are the chances 
that the entrepreneur that you're talking to that has invented packing materials or invented a new renewable energy apparatus or figured out something else actually knows how to do all of the things necessary for them to get to gigaton scale. Because, because mind you, if they don't get to gigaton scale, whether it's gigaton of carbon reduction or deployment, they're not going to invest. A gigaton of carbon basically requires a capex of around a trillion dollars to be invested. A trillion. Right, so unless they get to a trillion dollars of investment, it does not affect the U.S. economy. It does not affect the global economy. It doesn't affect carbon emissions. It doesn't affect water. It doesn't affect any of the things that all of us claim that we care about. And so you're in the situation where it is in fact possible, and I'm, I think, living proof of that, that you can make a lot of money and never make a difference.